to record. Good day, everyone. This is Zanda Hilger, and I coordinate the North Central Texas Caregiver Teleconnection on behalf of Dallas Area Agency on Aging and North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging. And it's a real pleasure for us to have our speaker back today, Holly Glover. She's become uh, quite an expert in this particular topic of ambiguous and um, anticipatory grief. And many of you have been dealing with this, and we hope that you'll have some new pointers. The program is being recorded. It will be available on the Caregiver Teleconnection site. And for those of you that are on the North Central Texas and Dallas Area Agency on Aging, our caregiver electronic newsletter, you'll have a direct link to that also from our website. Our speaker today, Holly Glover, is a licensed professional counselor and a national certified counselor. She currently works for the James L. West Center for Dementia Care in Fort Worth, Texas. She is the Director of Education and Family Support Services. She facilitates the center's family support groups and is involved in many of the numerous education services provided by the center. Holly is a dementia care specialist and certified grief counseling specialist that has over 29 years of experience in education and working with people of all ages. She has degrees from Southwestern Oklahoma State University, Sam Houston State University, and Dallas Baptist University. She also attended the Southwestern Theological Seminary to obtain hours in theology. Holly has been recognized as a national and statewide speaker on topics such as dementia, hospice, and professional and caregiver stress. One of the highlights of her career includes getting to meet and speak before First Lady Rosalind Carter and Senator Elizabeth Dole. She has also written a therapy to be used with patients at the end of life that focuses on the individual needs of the person and their family. Her passion is educating the public and helping families who have had a loved one diagnosed with dementia. Holly is married and has one daughter who is following in her footsteps. Joanna graduated from the University of Texas in Arlington in August 2020 with her master's degree in social work, specializing in hospice care. So multi-generational experts in the areas of end-of-life issues. Holly, again, thank you for sharing your time and expertise, and let's turn it over to you. Thank you. Glad to be back again. You mentioned that about my daughter. And uh, let me just add, my mom was a dementia care nurse for 34 years. So it most wow. definitely is multi-generational. So uh, very glad to be back to talk about this really difficult subject. And I don't know where everyone's located, but here in Fort Worth, it's a gloomy, gloomy day. It is raining. The sun's not out. I've had on my happy light which is a real light. It just happens to be the brand name, Happy Light for light therapy. It's real. Take a look at it. Um, and I've also got my diffuser going. And we were talking earlier, I've got tea tree in mind today because it's clarity and kind of help us be awake a little bit on days like this. Especially when we're going to talk about something that can be a little bit difficult to talk about. So let me share my screen real quick. And by the way, everyone, you will receive these slides after the presentation that you'll get from Teleconnection. Yes, because there's going to be a lot of information, so you don't need to try to write everything down because we're going to cover a lot. So I'm really glad that you're here with us today. And we're going to talk about two particular types of grief, ambiguous and anticipatory grief. And you can see there on the title, How to Grieve the Loss of the Living. Because when we have someone with dementia, we are going through the stages of grief back and forth, in and out, not just once, twice, but for years. And it really is grief. I was writing a little blog today and I was using the counselor term, if you can name it, you can tame it. So that's what we say whenever we're going through therapy. If you can name it, you can tame it. 
what if we were able to start saying, this is grief. I am grieving the loss of my loved one who's still very much alive. But we also go through anticipatory grief, and that's where we are grieving an unknown future. Because of dementia, it is so individualized. Nobody's disease looks like anyone else's. There's over 130 different types of dementia, so no one's walk is the same as anyone else's. Now, she mentioned earlier, I just loved this woman, Rosalind Carter. I was so blessed to get to work with her, to get to go out to the Rosalind Caregiver, uh, Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers at her uh, alma mater at Georgia Southwest. And I was blessed to be able to speak at the Georgia Caregiver of the Year in 2019 and sit with Mrs. Carter. So we just lost her and she ended up with dementia in the last years of her life. But this is the quote that she is most known for. And I want you to hear this. There are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. That's all of us. That's all of us. And no matter where you are in your journey right now, you may have played more than one of those roles already. There's my information, there's our objectives, and I want to jump right into grief. Typically, when we hear that word grief, folks will think of death. Because I do a grief support group that's the second Saturday of each month. And I'll have people say, oh, but my loved one hasn't passed away. Mm -hmm. Well, have you undergone any loss associated with your loved one's disease? Oh, certainly, definitely. Before the diagnosis we were going, th that's grief. Grief is loss. It's the loss of something, it's the loss of someone, and grief can feel, it can just be that dull ache that doesn't go away, it's just always there, or we can have something, this is a term I want you to take with you, we can have these things called grief burst, a grief burst that comes out of nowhere, and it's almost always associated with one of our senses, you may have had a lot of them over the holidays. When I smelled that particular scent, when I heard that song, when it came time to set the table and I realized, and you just have this grief burst out of nowhere. Or two minutes ago, you were fine, and now you're sobbing. Those are all very, very normal when we're going through grief. But people will oftentimes say, there must be something wrong with me. Is that, oh, yes, it's okay. I get much more worried about you if you're not doing things like that, honestly. There's all types of things that we grieve. But when we have a loved one who has dementia, even before the diagnosis, when we first think the word dementia, we haven't even said it out loud yet. Most of us are going to have that denial. No way. I bet it's their hearing. We better get their hearing aids checked. Uh, they need new glasses. They're just getting old. And then we've realized memory loss is not part of getting old. Slowing down is. Actual memory loss. That's not normal aging. Grief does not have a timetable. No one should say to you, and you should never say to yourself, I should be over this by now. If you love a person, you're never going to be over it. Now, there is something to time. Now, I will never say time heals all wounds, because that's not true. It doesn't heal all wounds. But boy, there is something about getting some distance between you and the loss. I'll share an example from one of my support groups. A woman's husband died five months ago and she had a really big photo blown up of him to use at his celebration of life. And for her, she wanted to put that big photo in his chair. But she said every time she looked at it for those first probably two or three months, she cried 
she'd be sitting watching TV and she'd look at the chair and he's not there, but his picture's there. But she mentioned in the last month that now as she walks by it, she kisses her hand and she kisses the photo and she's starting to smile. Same photo, same chair. What's different? There's a little bit of time between the loss. Doesn't mean that she doesn't miss him just as much or loves him just as much. There's just some time. So I want us to think about that word loss. We've been through a lot of loss in our life. A divorce is a loss. We may have lost a home, a business, a pet. If we've been through something like a bankruptcy or a repossession. What about in 2020, March of 2020? What did that look like? Loss. We lost our normal and as a nation, we went through something called collective grief. It's where a group of people's going through loss at the same time, and it's the same type of loss. We did it on 9-11-2001. As a nation, we went through a loss together, and we came together. All of that falls under that umbrella of grief. So think about whenever you go through loss, how do you cope? And where did you learn how to cope? We're going to talk more about that today. Most of us, no one ever taught us emotional hygiene. We were taught physical hygiene, how to take care of our bodies. But who taught you how to take care of your emotions and your feelings and your mind? For the most part, we learned it by watching others. We learned it by watching our mom, our dad, aunts, uncles, grandparents. But what if they did not have healthy coping skills? What did you learn to do? Did you learn to stuff feelings? Did you learn to use alcohol or food? Did you learn we don't talk about it? Or did you learn some healthy coping skills? It's really something to think about. And one of the exercises I do with my grief group is I've had people, now I didn't ask them to make spreadsheets, but boy, I get people who get into this exercise where we just start listing as far back as we can remember different losses that we've had in our life. Well, I remember losing that pet. My best friend moved away. My parents got divorced and kind of listing those out. And then in the next column, how did I deal with that? How did I come out on the other side of that? What did I learn from it? What were some positive skills or some negative coping skills that I may have used during that time? It'll really open your eyes as to how you handle grief. There's also a term that we use called mourning. And all mourning is, is that external expression. And it's different by cultures. You heard me say earlier about being at someone's celebration of life. And many people will use that term now instead of using the term funeral. Or they may use memorial, dressing in black, uh, lighting candles, releasing balloons. I've been at celebrations of life where we did that. But what it is is a ritual. And typically during this morning time, there's there's great sadness. And let's talk about what is sadness. And I've got sadness. I've got a lot of words on here. I'm a big fan of feelings wheels or emotion wheels. You can look that up. You can Google a feelings wheel. It's fantastic to use in therapy and in counseling. And I use it a lot with my support groups because people will say things like, well, I don't know if this is, I don't know that I'm sad. Well, let's put a name to it. I said earlier, if you can name it, you can tame it. Well, here's a lot of choices. This is something that comes from something like a feelings wheel. This is from the least intense up to the most intense with our feelings of sorrow or even being unhappy. But sadness is a range of emotions, just like we're going to talk about depression. People hear the word depression and think, well, that means the person's sad. You can be depressed and not be sad. Just like you can have dementia and not have memory loss yet, it will come. But there's a few dementias that 
present with no memory loss, presents with lots of other symptoms and the memory loss will come. And then let's look at that term bereavement. That's an actual term. It's that period of mourning and it's usually an intense time of grief. It's where we are going through that initial loss. What is my life going to look like now? What do I do now? I sit with our residents here at the West Center as they pass, and I've been doing that here where I worked before, and I was a volunteer for hospice even when I was still a school teacher many, many years ago. So by my count, I think I've been with close to 400 people as they've died. The most common question, especially if their loved one is placed in a memory care facility, a nursing home, and assisted living, the families will look at me and say something like this. What do I do now? What, what do I do tomorrow at noon? I always come up here at noon tomorrow. What do I do? I've been doing that for years. And what are they saying? Who, who am I? If I'm not being a caregiver, what am, what am I supposed to do? That's bereavement. It's that time where we're really figuring out what's this new baseline going to look like? What's this life going to look like now? It's the time where we're realizing that the loss is real and that it's permanent. When our loved one gets diagnosed with dementia, it's that initial shock that we go through of what's going to happen to our lives. That's a period of bereavement, and our loved ones are still very much alive. Now, I mentioned depression earlier. In the therapy world, in the counseling world, we really hate that the word depression falls under that horrible term that everybody hates, a mental illness. It is considered a mental illness and that gives it a stigma because depression and anxiety falls under mental illness. It's almost like it's been put in the category with schizophrenia or bipolar, but it is a medical illness. When I'm speaking about depression, I just call it brain health. When we're talking about our heart, we're not embarrassed. When we talk about our cardiac health, people will share with you all day long that they're taking high blood pressure medicine or something for cholesterol, but get to talking about an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety and people will clam up like they're ashamed of it, like they did something wrong. It can happen at any age, but when we are the caregiver of somebody with, de with dementia, depression and dementia go hand in hand. And there's over 20 common symptoms to depression. Sadness is just one of them. Now, sadness can look like or feel like an empty mood. I'm just empty. I don't have anything else to give. And it affects different people in different ways. Here are the most common symptoms of depression. And again, you're getting a copy of these slides, so you don't need to try to write them down. When you get this, I'm going to challenge you to get your highlighter and go through there and highlight any of these that you felt in the last two to four weeks. So let's say even since Christmas. And don't say to yourself, oh, but that's just because... Mm -mm. If you had the thought, highlight it, own it, name it, tame it, own it. It's okay. You're going through some hard times. A lot of people don't do the connection. Look, I've got on there digestive problems. When we're going through a whole lot of depression, when we're going through anxiety, when we're being a caregiver, we're dumping so much cortisol, it stops our, our digestive system. And we develop IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, very common in caregivers. What kind of treatments and therapy do we have for depression? Now look at these statistics. 80 to 90% of depression can be cured. 80 to 90%, but you've got to talk about and say this is what you're feeling. And another 20% 
can at least see a reduction in symptoms. That's telling us 100% of the time, even in those types of depression like Naomi Judd had, treatment-resistant depression, and that's a very real thing. She even talks about in her book, I've got it right here on my shelf, that she could get some relief of some of the symptoms. But what if one of the symptoms you could get some relief from was not being able to sleep? That would help a whole lot of things. And the earlier treatment begins, the more effective that it is. We've got to keep in mind there is no one size fits all. It takes time. It takes trial and error to find the treatment that works for you. And I think I accidentally put the signs and symptoms in there twice. So I want to make sure that you got those signs and symptoms. Now, I want to jump to this. And this is a powerful, powerful sentence. And many of you watching this or listening have lived it. There is nothing more difficult than grieving the loss of a loved one who is still alive. And as caregivers, this isn't something that's one and done. We go through it every day, all day long, week after week, month after month, year after year. That is why it's called the long goodbye. That's why caregivers say, I am cried out. There's not even any tears left. And it's also why when I'm sitting with families and their loved one passes, the first word that so many families will say is, oh my God, there's peace. There's peace on the other side of this. And in support groups, families that are on the other side of this will use that word peace over and over again. So let's talk about that first type of grief, ambiguous grief. So look at the photo. You've probably seen this before. And what do you see first? Do you see a duck? Do you see a rabbit? The answer is it's both. It's a duck and it is a rabbit. Because all ambiguous means, ambiguity means, is that it's open to more than one interpretation. So the definition of ambiguous grief, when we look at it, it is a loss without finality, which leaves us disoriented and not understanding the loss or how to move forward. We're left with many unanswered questions and a changed relationship. And this term actually came about during the Vietnam War. They started using the word ambiguous grief whenever they started labeling people MIAs, missing in action. What are those families supposed to do? Is my loved one dead? Is my loved one alive? Is my loved one captured? What am I supposed to feel about this? And that's where the term came from. But we've discovered in counseling that you can have ambiguous grief through a lot of different types of loss. A divorce is ambiguous grief. The person's still very much alive. It's the person you plan to spend the rest of your life with. But something happened and it didn't work out. Infertility, mental health issues, addiction, desertion, there's the MIA, dementia. When there's not the physical death, we actually can become consumed thinking that life might go back to normal. I bet it's the wrong diagnosis. Because today they seem to be doing pretty good. That's ambiguous grief. We don't have closure. Another thing that could make something be labeled ambiguous grief is if any part of it can give us a sense of shame. If our loved ones, we're really getting away from using the word behaviors. We are trying to switch everybody to using the word expressions. And now sometimes those expressions are challenging, but they're doing the best they can. But maybe they do something that embarrasses us. That also is part of ambiguous grief is when there's embarrassment over the loss. Now, again, this can be with any ambiguous grief. I'm focusing on dementia, but it can be um, my husband had an affair. I'm embarrassed about that. My child has an addiction because um, we can also be embarrassed that our loved one has dementia and maybe the way they express themselves in church or 
they don't want to get dressed or they said something in a restaurant. All kinds of things can happen. Another thing that falls under ambiguous grief is not acknowledging your pain publicly. Because when someone dies, we go through what's called conventional grief. We send flowers. We go to the service. We write them a card. We make a donation to whatever organization they ask. We know what to do. Now, this is something I want to share. One of the gentlemen in my support group, his wife passed away and he said, and he wasn't being funny. Now we laughed about it later, but when he said it, he was very serious. He said, you know, when I really, really knew that she was gone and it was real and she wasn't coming back, when people started showing up at the house with chicken, people started bringing over fried chicken. And if you live in the South, you just know that's what we do. We show up with some chicken. And he said, because I knew they wouldn't have been bringing food over if she was coming back. Wow. That's conventional grief. Because after a death, there's also a switch in family roles that everybody's used to. Okay, they used to pay the bills. I'm now going to pay the bills. They used to do the grass. I'm now going to mow the grass. They We take over their roles because they're gone. Well, during ambiguous grief, somebody's got to take those roles over, but they're still here and we don't talk about it. There are people who want to help us. They don't know how. They don't know what to ask. Maybe they're embarrassed because they don't understand the disease themselves. We have to ask for help. And we've got to be specific in what we tell people we need. We've got to build a support team because this is a disease we can't do by ourselves. Many times families will say things like family matters are private and they won't allow conversations to start. But the statistics are too high on the death of family caregivers. 68% of the time, the spouse of a person with dementia will die first. 68% of the time. Because of the stress of being a caregiver. And the latest staggering statistic to me is that they are now tracking adult children. And adult children who are caregivers of their parents who are still working outside of the home, married, children, maybe still have children at home or grandchildren or boomerang children who came back, 64% of the time adult children die before their own parents. I spoke at one of those funerals two Saturdays ago. She was 62 years old. I'm not just giving you numbers because I read numbers. I'm giving you numbers because I live them every day. I've got another funeral this Friday. We kill ourselves taking care of everybody else. We've got to be careful and take care of ourselves. Now, some of those roles that our loved ones who are still alive, but they leave empty. This list was actually put together by my support group. I had them start listing because it's called a secondary loss is what this is called. Secondary loss. The loss of the list of roles that your loved one feel that either you now have to fill or you got to find somebody else to fill it. And some of them are simple. Like I had a lady say, um, my husband always loaded the dishwasher and he could get everything in there just right. And I have the hardest time figuring out how. It's a little loss, but those add up. Taking out the trash. I had somebody mention that he was my movie watching partner. And look at all those other things they listed. And I thought one of the most powerful ones was that last one. And the woman said, he was always my stabilizer, if that makes sense. In the bed, I could reach over and he was there and I knew I was okay. If it was time to paint the house, I had somebody to talk to about it. And he is still alive, but he, I'm his stabilizer now. That's another really good exercise 
is to list the roles that your loved one played that either now you are filling the role or someone else is filling the role. I mentioned a feelings chart earlier, and here's an example of a really good one. I also mentioned earlier, most of us were not taught emotional hygiene, and we have no formal training on how to deal with loss. And we only really start to heal and work through grief when we acknowledge it. So we have to give ourselves permission to grieve the loss of the relationship, even if the person's still alive, because that's what we're grieving. We're grieving the loss of the relationship the way it was. Now, we don't want to land and stay focused in that because if we land in all the losses, you want to talk about depression. With dementia, we have to focus on the present because we don't know about the future. Connections and the present today. But we've got to acknowledge the past. Acknowledge it. Give yourself permission to grieve the loss of the relationship the way it was. It's okay to say things. And again, say them out loud. Write them on paper. I miss my mom cooking Christmas. I miss my dad putting up the tree. Because we just went through the holidays, so a lot of this is really raw. And you may be even going, what is this I'm feeling? What's going on that I just saw mom, dad, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, whoever it was? What got triggered over the holidays? Ambiguous grief. And our bodies are designed to process grief. They're not designed to store grief. Just like um, if we have too much fat, we get consequences. When we have too much grief, we get consequences. There's some things that you can do to memorialize losses. For example, going to favorite restaurants, eating favorite foods, telling favorite stories, continuing traditions. I've got a lot of them listed here. Finding a ritual that brings you pleasure each day. Something that you look forward to every day, even if it's just for a few minutes. During the pandemic, I was trying to get everybody to get on YouTube and watch just little two, three minute videos of something that makes you smile so that you'll stop dumping cortisol and start having a little bit of dopamine or serotonin, something other than cortisol. My go-to is Carol Burnett. I go to Carol Burnett and Tim Conway and watch those little three, four, five minute little clips and smile every time. Sometimes I'm smiling through tears but I'm smiling in that moment. Here's some more things I've listed that you can do about it. Writing letters is a great way. I Some of the most amazing letters I've ever seen people write has been to the disease itself. Dear Alzheimer's disease, expletive, expletive, expletive. <laughs> You put whatever you need to say in it and you tell that disease what you think about it. Because our loved one didn't do anything to make this happen and they didn't do it on purpose. Write that letter to Parkinson's, to Lewy body, to frontotemporal, whatever it is you need to write it to. And I've had folks bury letters, put them on a balloon and release them, burn them, shred them, do whatever you need to do. Building resilience, this is a great time of year to talk about this. It takes 28 to 30 days to make or break a habit. I don't like resolutions because I'm always about making or breaking habits rather than a resolution. But what could you do or stop doing? Because if we can hit it for 30 days straight, and it's hard, it's hard. Giving up um, sodas, oh, that was hard. You want to talk about an addiction? I had an addiction, Diet Dr. Pepper, and it really did take, it took me about six weeks to stop craving it. But it can be done. Boy, am I better for it, that's for sure. There is no timeline again. The only way to move forward is to feel the hard feelings. Some of the things that we want to make sure we do is to celebrate what remains and be open to a new type of relationship. 
we embrace whatever's going on with us, but find those silver linings. Look for what your loved one can still do. You might even discover something that they can do that you didn't know they could do. I've got someone in my support group that has a beautiful story. Her husband painted, he never painted, painted this lovely picture of a sailboat. And he told me, I asked him to give me a title for it. He called it Sailing Away in Texas. I framed it for her and gave it to her. She's on my grief support group still. Her husband passed away several years ago and she still has that framed. He never painted before, but in dementia, he could paint. That right side of his brain remained enough that he could do artistic type things, even when his language had failed. Understand the illness is not the person and then find meaning in what you're experiencing. You're developing a skill set you never wanted if your loved one has dementia. We didn't want this. But boy, are there things that you can do with it. There's two types of pain in the world, pain that simply hurts you and pain that inspires you to grow. And grieving is moving forward through your feelings. Let's switch to anticipatory grief. And this is grieving a loss before it happens. We find out our loved one has dementia. We get to doing some research on it. And we discover that all dementias, again, over 130 different types, but all dementias are progressive and they are all terminal. If they don't die from something else, they will die from the end stages of this terminal disease. But we have no idea when. And we can look at statistics all day long. Doesn't tell us about our loved one. My mom was told that she had two years. That was 11 years ago. Early onset. Maximum of five years. It was 11 years ago. There's a reason they're called statistics. Because somebody's on the high end and somebody's on the low end of those things. So why are we not talking about anticipatory grief? Sometimes we don't talk about it because there's shame and guilt about mourning somebody who's still alive. We're hesitant to express the type of pain because you may have had this happen to you. I have where somebody who means well says something like, well, at least they're still alive. Wow. Yep, they're still alive. What does quality of life look like? That's somebody who does not understand dementia that says that they mean well. So let's look at how anticipatory grief differs from conventional grief. It has more anger. So when we're looking at the feelings wheel, one of the feelings on there is anger. And when we study emotions, we find out that in many people, anger is the easiest emotion because it's easy for me to get louder and broader and maybe point and you will either shut up or you'll walk away or you'll just shut down. But now I'm in control. There's a reason we've got anger management classes all over the place because I can hit my horn, throw my fist, say a bad word, and now I'm in control of this. The first support group I did online in March of 2020, we'd never done support groups online. Why would we? But the very first one I did, I had all these people come on and the first daughter who came on started cursing at me because we'd shut down. She couldn't get in to see her dad. And I could see all these faces and they're shaking their heads. And I let her talk. And she, boy, was she mad at me. I was actually out on FMLA. I just had a knee replacement. I didn't do it, but I let her talk. I let her talk. 
She was mad at our CEO. She was mad at our administrator. She was mad at the governor. She's mad at the president. She's mad at everybody. And I let her talk because everybody felt the same way. And as she talked, the loud anger started to turn into tears. And she said two things. What if by the time I get back in there, my daddy doesn't know who I am? And what if I don't get back in before he dies? So what was at the root of that anger? Fear. If we're really, really honest, usually at the root of anger, almost all anger is fear. Let's look at the symptoms of anticipatory grief other than just anger, because there's physical, behavioral, psychological, social, and spiritual symptoms. And we'll go through these fairly quickly so that I can leave some time for questions at the end. These are some of the symptoms of anticipatory grief. Here's an example. Let's say you've placed your loved one in a memory care center and you go to buy groceries. And you're in the oatmeal aisle. And you don't eat oatmeal, but your loved one did. And you find yourself crying because you don't need to buy oatmeal anymore. That is very normal grief. Looking over at the chair where they always sit, the side of the bed where they used to be, a Hallmark commercial coming on, a song. Very similar to ambiguous grief with these type things being triggered by our senses. But we can also have resentment. We can get mad at our loved one for getting sick. That's normal. It's normal. Our rational brain knows they didn't do it on purpose. But part of us, this was not the plan. This wasn't the plan. We were supposed to travel. We were supposed to keep the grandkids. My mom, my dad was supposed to be at my wedding. They were supposed to help me raise my kids. All of that's anticipatory grief. And then there's the guilt. Guilt's probably my number one topic that we have come up. And I really encourage people to try not to use guilt because guilt sounds like you've been sentenced because you did something wrong. Could it be remorse? Could we rename that? Another part of anticipatory grief is whenever you realize that you're building a life without the person with dementia. You're making plans without them. Another symptom is you might, I've got it listed there as heightened concern, where you become extremely concerned about things that you have some control over. And I've shared the story of a Christmas sweater, the daughter who brought a Christmas sweater and wanted her mama in a brand new red Christmas sweater on the day we were doing Santa pictures. And her mama always wore a yellow sweater that wasn't hers and it had a big old stain on it, but she loved it. She loved it. That was her favorite. And the daughter insisted we change her. And I ended up talking to her and saying, we can either get today a really good picture of you and your mom and Santa and your mama have that yellow sweater on that's not hers and has a big stain on it. Or we can get in a great big fight with your mom about changing clothes. We're probably not going to get a picture. She's going to get mad. She's going to hit. She's going to yell. She's going to scream. She's going to kick. She's going to punch. She's going to curse. Which of those do you want to remember? And we took a picture with a yellow sweater with a big stain on it. It was her last Christmas. That daughter's talked to me since then and went, I'm so happy to see that yellow sweater every time I look at that picture. But she was trying to have some control over something. And it was coming out as anger. Other things we might do when we know our loved one has a terminal illness is we may rehearse the death. We may rehearse that phone call. The panic when we look down and we see it's the facility or we find them ourselves. All of that is a normal part 
of anticipatory grief. Now, there are some benefits to anticipatory grief because we have some time. With other types of loss, some deaths, we don't have any time. They just happen. But with dementia, we have some time to do some legacy building. Early in the disease, with my grandfather, I did a Grandparent Remembers book where I went and interviewed him. And, oh, I hate that it was before cell phones because I didn't get to video it, but I was able to write down the answers to the questions. We can record their stories, and now we can really record it. We can do a bucket list. We can travel. We can talk to our loved ones about their final wishes and make sure that we know what they want as far as funeral arrangements and burial. We can work through guilt and anger and start finding some closure and being able to let go of things that maybe aren't worth holding on to anymore. We can take care of that unfinished business because bedside, when a person is imminent, is not the time to be trying to take care of unfinished business. I see it too often. The family call has gone out. They've become imminent. They're dying. And people come in and try to take care of 50 years worth of unfinished business. It's not the time to do it. The benefit to anticipatory grief is the time to make peace with that person who's passing. It's interesting because patients, even people who have dementia that are looking at the end of their life, go through anticipatory grief as well. Because look what I've got bold there. They are losing all their relationships at the same time rather than just one, like what we're going through. We're losing our mom, our dad, our husband, our wife, our brother, our sister. We're losing everything. And they will go through something called a life review. And especially if the person has a dementia like maybe a vascular dementia, it's maybe a little bit of a, a milder type of dementia and their reasoning may have still stayed or their judgment may have still stayed. I had a woman come in my office, sit down across from me. She was in her 90s, still walking. This is about three weeks before she died. And she sat down and said, do you have any regrets? And I said back to her, I think we all do. Tell me about yours. That's what she was saying as I need to talk. And boy, she did. She told me things she hadn't told her kids because I was safe but I didn't have the emotional attachment that her kids had. She was doing a life review. She had dementia to the point she needed to be placed, but she still went through that at end of life. It's a time when we can say to somebody, we'll miss each other, won't we? Where we start having meaning and we start having closure. Now, the question gets asked, if we go through ambiguous and anticipatory grief, does it help our grieving later, later on? Well, we're still going to have conventional grief because there's no way we can get ready for that final breath. Even if you've done it with other people, even if you've lost other people, there's just no way to be prepared for that moment. And we don't know what day it's going to be. And as I've said to caregivers over the years, I've even held up a calendar before when they're going, I can't believe it's today. Well, can you pick a better day? There's not a better day. Honest to goodness. I had two people. I was up here on Christmas Day and Christmas Eve that were passing away. Those families actually were really at peace with it. They both were Christian families who said, you know what? I think that one was a mom, one was a dad. Uh, they were saying, I think they would think this was a great day to go to be with the Lord on the day he came to be with. I mean, it was their perspective. It was all their perspective because they could have been going, oh, my God, Christmas is ruined. This will never be the same. Neither one of them looked at it that way. It was perspective. And then quickly, I'm going to go through some ways to deal with some anticipatory grief. One is reframing the situation. That's what we were just talking about. Um. It's interesting, reframing the situation, that same gentleman who used the, the chicken and the people bringing the chicken over, he said he started journaling before bed after she passed away, and he came to support group one day, and he said, last night I dreamed, and there was no dementia. She was whole again. 
It was us. It was us before the disease. And I realized in the big course of our relationship, that dementia was just this much. It wasn't this much. Trying to do something about the loss. This is where sometimes we'll start trying uh, other opinions, alternative medicines, looking for outside assistance. And ambiguous grief gives us time to do that. Trying to control our own situations is another one. And a lot of people turn to spirituality during this time. They start back into their religion, their prayer, their meditation, uh, being out in nature, listening to music, because it's a way for them to learn to cope and cope in a healthy way. One thing that we do is we encourage people to get into support groups or to find a counselor, especially a grief counselor, and not everybody specializes in grief. There's not lots of us out there because grief counseling, uh, people will even say, why in the world would you go into some, well, somebody has to do it. And it is one of those that if it's your calling, it's your calling. It's something that you can do. We don't want to get into what's called complicated grief. Now that happens when we're six months out from the loss and we cannot function. Now it is okay if earlier in the loss, we can't, I can't get out of the bed. I can't, I can't, but tomorrow I can. Now next week I might have a day when I can't get out of bed and that's okay. But when we're six months out, let's just say from the death of someone and I still can't work, I'm not eating, I'm not functioning, I'm not bathing, I'm not, this is turned into what's called complicated grief and we need some help with that. And we also need to be able to give our loved one permission to go. We have to be able to give them permission to die. And along with that comes forgiveness. I've got it in bold. Resentment is a poison you prepare for another person, but you drink yourself. Letting go of resentment and letting go of hurt is very, very freeing. People will hang on. I've watched it. If I've watched it once, I've watched it dozens and dozens of times where people will hang on because family members aren't letting them go. We have to let them go. We can let them know we're going to miss them and that we love them, but that we're going to be okay and we're going to take care of other people. I found a list here of 40 things that you can do at home to distract yourself, things that you can do to take care of yourself and some of them are very, very simple. Some of them are very easy. Some of them you may not have thought of doing before, but it's just a list of things that you can do yourself. So you'll be getting this again. You're getting uh, all of these slides. The reality of dementia is that they are both here and they are gone at the same time. You're taking care of yourself while you're taking care of somebody else. There's part of you that probably wishes it was over while part of you also wishes they would continue to live. These are common, common feelings to have. And you might also be very sad about your lost hopes and dreams, but maybe very happy about things you're going to do someday or hopes and dreams of someday. One of the things that I encourage you to do for other people is to encourage others going through grief. And the best thing you can do is just be present. When someone's walking through grief, no one can come in and fix it for them. I can't fix grief for someone, and I'm a grief therapist, but boy, can I listen, and I can listen well, and I can sometimes help reframe a thought, or have we thought about looking at it this way, but if we can find someone that'll just listen and not advise and not judge, wow, does that make a difference, and you might be that person for someone else. Little small gestures like dropping a card in the mail, uh, sending food over unexpectedly, leaving something on their porch. And don't ask, how are you? And if someone does ask that, here's my generic answer. Some days are better than others. And that's the truth. If you're going to ask somebody something and you really are serious, ask them how they feel. There's a difference. How are you feeling today? Tell me. Tell me how you're feeling today. Ask how they're feeling and let them know that you're there anytime for anything. This is the summary about ambiguous and anticipatory grief. It's very difficult. It's exhausting. But just acknowledging them will help us. Don't underestimate how you'll be affected by grief. And give yourself permission to grieve at your own pace. 
I encourage you to embrace grief and not run away from it and help others through it, and it will help you as well. And I always say, please become better and not bitter. Here's a list of resources for you, and you are getting these. There's my information. You can call me or email me at any time. Let me stop sharing. We've got a couple of minutes left. Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Oh, yes, Sanda, thanks for mentioning the empty chair. That is one um, that's actually on my list. The it empty is. chair. It is on my list. The empty mm -hmm. chair is whenever you are sitting across from an empty chair and you can envision or see your loved one in that chair and you say all the things that you need to say. The really, really hard things, the good things, the thank yous, because our loved one who has dementia, we very likely are not going to get back the response that we might need or want, but it is therapeutic to be able to sit across from that empty chair, make sure nobody is going to be bothering you, and give yourself time. Or if you write a letter to your loved one, sit and read it to the empty chair. I've had people sit and read it to an empty chair with a picture in it. Therapeutic. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions, comments? I know we're right at time. There was a lot of information. I hope this is something that you'll think about. And if you do come up with something, you can contact me. You've got my um, information. Anyone have questions? You can see why this is such a powerful program that I asked Holly to do it again. Um, it's probably, honestly, it is the most thorough uh, program not just on anticipatory and and ambiguous grief, but just grief. It's just very thorough and has a lot of information. I would encourage you to review it, listen to the recording again, and then look at all the slides that you got. Just a wealth of information. Thank you. I saw uh, Dawn. Did you ha have something? Uh, yes. Um, I. I'm really thankful for all of this because I'm wanting to help others. I'm an ambassador for the Association of Frontal Temporal Dementia. Oh. Um, but I lost my daughter, my daughter to dementia at the age of 33. She was oh. diagnosed at 29 oh. and she had just become a mother before having the noticeable symptoms. My question is, um, she had just had a baby and I became like the mother figure because her husband divorced her and um, her son now is only six and a half. But anyway, she, we um, took care of her for four years, 24 seven, my husband and I, um, until she passed a year ago on New Year's day, but how it really struck me, you know, that that's a role that I took on and I've had to grieve that role because after um, she passed, I miss her terribly and truthfully the anticipatory grief of watching her lose her whole life at such a young age was horrible. Um, and I still grieve her, but I grieve my grandson because his dad doesn't let us have him as much. And beforehand we had regular visitation like monthly and overnight once a month for a weekend. How do I, he's not one that's real receptive, but how do I explain that to him of how important that is for us to carry on that relationship. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I wonder if approaching it, um, for, that that is part of your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> that child's part of your daughter. And, right. and you might even can kind of uh, approach him with, you know, God forbid, Bid, you know, I would never wish anything happened to your child, but if you could just imagine now that you're yeah. a parent. You that's do, not, uh, that's okay to say. I think that's a good. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. It's all in how you say it when you're saying it with compassion, because it's yeah. one thing to go in and Mr. What do you think? Are, you know, right. that's <laughs> but if you yeah. come at it with compassion, right, that's powerful to say. Well, I just, it's just been, you know, we miss her, but I know I can't have her, but it's like he's dangled there because, and it's like he has control. And I think it's because we did through the court give, you know, fight for my daughter to see him, even though she was ill, because she was still his parent. And though she was ill, um, 
it, we felt she needed that bond and they bonded even though she couldn't speak for the last two years and she was they almost were more I don't know what you want to say um playmates in some respects because she yeah. became very young acting but they had a bond that nobody can ever take away and he didn't know what he was missing in a real mom right but how unfair to him to take me away when I was his nurturer then but I mean not that we do get to see him but not we've not been able to have him overnight at all and it's been really but rough on him but really rough on us yeah I think I would approach it as a parent talking to a parent oh not that's a good parent. idea yeah mm -hmm. a parent talking to a parent thank you I appreciate that yeah thanks for sharing that and for everyone who didn't realize because you said 29 uh, mm -hmm. from temporal dementia now the age limit that you find on FTD frontotemporal is now 30 to 65. It's the most mm -hmm. common dementia before um, 65. What type did she have? She had behavioral variant. Yeah. The behavioral variant. Mm -hmm. And it took almost two years to diagnose her, but um, it was extremely overwhelming because no, no doctor, nobody was, um, it wasn't on the radar. So it took a while. Nobody's yeah. looking for dementia at 29. Nobody. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's no. looking for dementia at 49, honestly. Exactly. They just don't. Exactly. That's why it takes so long to get diagnosed. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank well, you. I really appreciate everybody being here today. And again, I'm serious when I say, now, if you email me and it bounces back, call me. We've had to really lock down our uh, email system. And boy, I've had a lot of people saying, I emailed the exact email and it bounced back so you can always call me but try to email me thank you so and, much and you can also email the uh, where you got the confirmation from caregiver teleconnection mm -hmm. and they'll forward it to me or directly to holly any of those questions just an incredible amount of information and i imagine everybody um has several walkaways from this program uh, someone, let's see what this is before we let you go. I've been taking care of my husband for years now. Mixed primary is Lewy body. As a 30-year therapist, this is the best thing I've seen. Personally, I just wonder how trauma ties into the grief. I'm a member of the LB spouses caregiver group and sometimes I wonder witnessing death and dying in a chronic way comes up before and after death with flashes of memory for some caregivers I just think it takes a significant amount of support and skill to cope with this disease absolutely yeah. there is a reason why we're moving from um, person-centered care to trauma-informed person-centered care you're exactly right i've been doing that talk across the country for the last two years trauma plays into uh, trauma plays into a person who has dementia and how that dementia is going to affect them because they're literally going back in time if there's been trauma trauma is going to come back up and then it goes through us. If we're the caregiver and we've had trauma, it's going to bring trauma back up in us. So you are exactly right. I went yes. back and got my certification in trauma therapy for that very reason because Excellent point. Say, oh, this trauma come up. So boy, you're right on that one. Uh, one other comment. Thank you so much. Caretaker for my mom slash BFF, my best friend. I've been crying in my cubicle for the past hour. But it's so good to know that there are people who truly understand this experience. I hope you are able to provide this to as many caretakers as possible. This has been so therapeutic and helpful. And that is from Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that is the last comment or question that we have. Several people said, I, I plan to review interesting information learned a lot um oh thank you as always thank you for all you've added with more suggestions some days are better than others quote for the day 
That's my very good. much so. Very Days much better than others. Some hours are better than others. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank so, you. Uh, everyone take care of themselves today. Have a good day. Holly, again, thank you for sharing not only your knowledge, but your wisdom. Thank you, everyone. Join us again next month. Bye-bye. Bye.